Hello, Bob here. I just wanted to say a little something about the conversation you're about to hear because it's a bit of a departure from our norm. It's with Russ Roberts, who is host of the Econ Talk podcast, and it's appearing on both the Econ Talk feed, where its posting date is, I think, uh, February 19th, and the non zero feed, which is to say this feed. So that's why it doesn't include my standard on the fly introduction of the guest. And that's why I'm introducing the guest now in advance. So Russ is an economist and is president of Shalom College in Jerusalem, which I may be mispronouncing. And he's a fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. And he writes the Listening to the Sirens newsletter on Substack. As you'll hear, Russ and I have significant differences of perspective on the Gaza war and the Israel-Palestine conflict generally, uh, but I think we agree that this was a very constructive conversation and was illuminating for both of us, and I hope you will check it out. Thanks. So, Russ, I'm really looking forward to this conversation uh, because we do have, uh, I think, different perspectives on the subject. For starters, you're Jewish, you're Israeli, you're in Israel. I'm none of the above. Um, I think we also have ideological differences that may become apparent in the course of this. I should say you're also an, an American citizen. In fact, you spent most of your life in America, but you've been in Israel a few years now. Um, and we've agreed that this is going to be a departure from both our formats in the sense that we'll be kind of interviewing each other. That's also known as a conversation, I guess. Uh, you suggested I ask the first question. Um, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and it has to do with a question some Americans are asking about uh, what's going on in the mind of Israelis. Um, I actually heard an extreme version of this last night in talking to a young progressive. And I do think this is a question that's more on the mind of people left of center in America. Um, what he said was, I think the Israelis have lost their minds. Let me put that, before I ask you to respond, let me put it in slightly less confrontational terms. And also, sure. and also set the context um, with some numbers. So uh, as a lot of people know by now on October 7th, um, you know, Hamas attacked uh, Israel, killed, I guess, uh, more than 1,100 people, nearly 800 of those civilians. Uh, President Biden early on, uh, putting that in context, noted, you know, Israel's a smaller country than America. And if you correct for population, which of course it's, it's a crude exercise, but, but uh, kind of a useful one, that would be like more than 40,000 Americans uh, being killed. Um, the civilians alone, I guess, would be like 30,000. So again, to, to put it in crude terms, like 10 9-11s or something, leaving aside the qualitative difference uh, in the nature of the attack. Um, so since then, of course, uh, Israel has uh, launched a, an attack or counterattack on Gaza. Um, the uh, and the numbers we have, I know I've heard you express some doubt about these numbers. Uh, I I've heard that American intelligence and the State Department thinks they're solid. I haven't heard Israeli intelligence uh, reports of Israeli intelligence disputing them. But if you want to talk about this later, we can. But anyway, the official numbers are uh, twenty five thousand Gazans dead. Um, Israel says 9,000 of those are militants. Now, historically, militaries have always erred on the high side in assessing enemy casualties. Uh, but if we, even if we accept those, that leaves, um, what, 16,000 dead civilians in Gaza. If you do the same crude but useful uh, kind of conversion, correcting for population, you get... Um, uh, what 3.6 the equivalent of 3.6 million Americans dying, 2.3 million civilians. So if you look at civilians alone in Gaza, you would say that that's like uh, 779 11s or something like like eight nine 11s every day since October 7th or nine or whatever the number turns out to be. So again, in in both cases, I think um, you know you can only go so far with with this kind of comparison. I would say in both cases, if you look at the qualitative dimension, it's worse than 9-11. Uh, uh, so people should should add that to that. But anyway, so the question 
that a lot of people on the left are asking. There, there's actually two questions I would say about uh, the way Israelis are processing this. There's surprise expressed by some people that we're not hearing more Israelis saying, wait a second, my moral qualms about what we're doing to civilians in Gaza have gotten to a point where I just think we should stop. My sense is that there's still overwhelming support for the uh, for the military operation in Gaza. And then there's a different version of the question that is actually more like the one I ask, which is about the wisdom of it, right? Like, like you're creating a situation where if you do the math, uh, hundreds of thousands of Gazans will now be able to say uh, a member of my immediate family or my best friend or something was either killed or maimed. Uh, as a as a result of of this, and that's where you know out of a population of two million people, that's that's like a lot of intense hatred. And I'm certainly not saying there wasn't hatred already, but uh, you know, the question I ask is even if you somehow magically eliminated Hamas, killed everyone in Hamas, wouldn't you expect that with that much hatred, that many people? Uh, I would say in many cases, willing to die to kill an Israeli in retaliation, you know, given uh, that kind of trauma. Um, don't you think you're just planting the siege for the next Hamas, even if you somehow kind of extinguish the Hamas brand, so to speak? So there's a lot there. Take your time. There's a lot of context for you to uh, establish as well. Yeah, so the two things that at the heart of your opening question are, are the moral issue and the practice, strategic issue. And I'm sure in, in answering this, I'm, uh, I'll get lost and I'll forget one of the two and, and you'll bring me back. Uh, it's 4.30 in the afternoon here. It's 9.30 in the morning where you are. It's been a long day for me. I'm old, Bob. I get, We're both I'm old, train of thought more than I We're used to. I'll do the I'm best. sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not okay. gonna let you have that one, but, but yes, it is late um, today. I'll do the best I can. Later in the um, day, not later in your life necessarily, but go ahead. What? I said later in the day, not, not so much later in your life, I think. Yeah, fair enough. But, but go ahead. So it's interesting. One of the things that has fascinated me since October 7th, it's fascinated me for a long time. And my listeners will be familiar with it. And we did a recent episode with Hillel Cohen on the historical events of 1929 which has not aired yet, you haven't heard it, but um, that conversation focused a great deal on the fact that inevitably we all have our narratives and in having our narratives, we build them from evidence and that requires pretty much accepting, accepting some things as true and some things as not true. And we are a thoughtful person should be aware that some of the things that I think are true, for example, or not, and some of the things I think are not true might be. So I think that's an important background to this conversation. One of the reasons that we might differ in our viewpoints is simply because we have different facts. Uh, literally, you've chosen a set to think about, I've chosen a set to think about, and of course, some of our, my facts aren't facts, and vice versa, probably. And so I hope in this conversation, we'll explore some of the things that we believe that you and I might disagree on whether they're true or not even. Forget about how we weight them or value them. So it's interesting when I, just from your opening remarks, when I talk about October 7th, I say 1,200 people were killed. I don't make the distinction between civilians and soldiers, which I should. I usually just say 1,200 people were killed. I think it's important to make that distinction. The soldiers who were killed on that day were mainly Israeli soldiers who, in a very disorganized, chaotic way, uh, responded to what they realized was happening in the southern part of the country near the Gaza board, Gazan border and fought back and got many of them got killed. And, and that was more like a war. And so those casualties are different uh, compared to, say, people who were in their house and Hamas broke in and, and murdered them. Um, this Two other things you did not mention, very interesting, uh, were the, the sexual violence. Um, a lot of women, it appears, pretty conclusively, were raped on October 7th. Uh, and, of course, 250 or so Israelis, 240, 
were taken hostage. 136 of those are still unaccounted for in Gaza. We don't know if they're alive or dead. Some of them are alive, we think. Maybe most of them are all of them, but we don't know. No international agency has visited those folks. Uh, the ones who aren't there anymore were released. Uh, those were uh, mostly uh, women and children, uh, but there are still women and children in Gaza, at least who were abducted. Um, and so the first question is uh, the moral question. And, and preceding it, I should say, is your question about the mood of Israel, which I think is very accurate. Uh, most Israelis uh, that I know, and I swim, of course, in my particular circles, most Israelis I know are not happy. We are unhappy that civilians are being killed, but we still are resolved to press forward. There is some, I think, underlying anxiety here in Israel that the two goals that the uh, Unity Coalition has set for itself, uh, eliminating Hamas and rescuing the hostages are not just not compatible, but actually at odds with one another. Um, and many of us also worry, as you do, and I'll come back to this, this strategic question, you can't really eliminate Hamas. It's an idea. You could eliminate people who currently espouse the values of Hamas. Certainly they are likely to be replaced by other people and so on. Uh, as a backdrop for all of this discussion, I want to add one more thing, and then I'll turn to the explicit question. Uh, one of the most jarring things about moving to Israel, which I did two and a half years ago, as you say, after six decades plus in the United States, uh, is that the Middle East is not like um, the Beltway outside Washington, D.C., where I live most recently, nor is it like... Uh, Silicon Valley and the Palo Alto area where I've summered and lived for a couple years of my life. Um, nothing like the Midwest where I lived for over a decade in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a very different set of expectations here as a, as a resident in terms of what the culture is. Uh, even though I've known a lot of Jews in my life, Israel's culture is distinctive. And the military culture here in the Middle East is also very different. The rules of the game, the so-called expectations and what's fair play are really different. And I think that's very hard for people to accept. Uh, a lot of the people I do talk to are either one time, you know, former Americans, what, what do we call Anglos here, people who speak English because they grew up in the United States or England. Uh, but I know a number of native born folks and you're absolutely right. Uh, I have met a couple of people who think that the military response to October 7th is both a immoral response and a strategic failure. But that's a very, very small view. It's a minority view. Um, I'd say the only, the only, the biggest variation is how horrified people are, relatively horrified they are about the civilian casualties. And I'll turn to those. Just, I would just say one more thing before I continue, which is um, I tried to write, uh, the case for the military action and an essay. You can find that on my Substack, uh, which is listening to the sirens. And that essay is called, I think, can a nation turn the other cheek or should a nation, should a nation turn the other cheek? Um, because some people said, not many, but some people said, because they think this is immoral and because they think it's a uh, tactical or strategic mistake, Israel should have simply, in response to October 7th, sealed off its border more effectively than it had use different kinds of technology more effectively than it had and so on. Um, so now let's turn to the issue of casualties. And I'll try to both talk about what I think the general attitude is here and uh, my own personal attitude, which are not always the same, but often are. Um, first, I wanna make one thing, say one thing very clearly. There's not a lot of bloodlust here that I sense either from the soldiers or their parents. And I speak to a lot of parents of soldiers. They're my colleagues. Uh, there's a lot of resolve to do something about what happened on October 7th. Uh, there's a lot of misgiving about whether we're being effective. And we will talk about that in the strategic part because there are different components to that. Uh, but there's not a lot of, of vengeance, literally. It's more like this cannot stand. We cannot live in a country that was designed to be a haven for Jews from Jew hatred in the aftermath of the Holocaust. 
and allow our citizens to be uh, slaughtered as Jews and our daughters and sisters to be raped and our children to be abducted from a Jewish state. Uh, so the strongest impulse, there are two impulses that people have here. The first is to get the hostages back. We've had some success, not much, some. Uh, and the second is to remove the threat of a second or a future October 7th. Um, in doing that, we have leveled much of Gaza, maybe half of the buildings. And in northern Gaza, it's much more than half. It's rubble. It has um, been flattened to a large extent. Um, many of the people who lived in those buildings are not in them, weren't in them when the bombing occurred, but some of them were, and those are the civilian casualties. Uh, I have expressed some uncertainty about their number, but it kind of doesn't matter in a way, right? The idea that, oh, if it's really only, it's not 16,000 civilians, only 10. Is that okay? Is that proportionate? I mean, the whole idea of proportion, I think, is a very strange concept in this context. So the first thought that I have in answer to the moral question is simply, this cannot stand. And so when people ask me, and I'll ask you, Bob, when, when I'm done with this long monologue, I apologize. Uh, when people say to me, it's disproportionate or it's immoral or we're committing, Israel's committing genocide in, in Gaza or mass murder, which I, I disagree with both those claims, but we are killing a lot of civilians and it's horrifying and I hate it. Uh, the Israeli response overwhelmingly is twofold. Uh, we didn't start this. Uh, we were attacked first. We we're defending ourselves. And second, we are acting in a way, either because of our own moral co code or pressure from the outside world, could be both, to minimize civilian casualties consistent with making progress in our goals. So yesterday, 21 Israelis died because two buildings collapsed that we had not flattened. Um, and so there's not a lot of, there's a lot of anger here uh, about that and, and a feeling that we are protecting civilians in Gaza with our own children's lives. And I call them children. Some of them are 18 to 20, our soldiers, but a lot of them are grownups. They're people with kids. They're in the reserves. Um, many, many of the people who've died are not conscripts of 18 to 20. They are people in the ages of 25 to 40 who have wives and children. Most of the dead are men, um, almost all, I think, in the in the war part. So. The moral case for most Israelis, and I'm keeping it short, we will talk more about it, is uh, we didn't start this. Uh, Hamas could end this anytime they want. They could lay down their arms, surrender. The leadership could uh, surrender and evacuate or leave and release the 136 people or whatever number is still alive, and we would stop. We, we don't like it. We have no desire to kill civilians or uh, innocents in Gaza, and we have even less desire to see our own people killed. So in the moral case, that's the standard argument you hear, and I'll let you respond to it. On the strategic case, I, I think the idea is that while it's true that many people will hate us who are currently there who will lose loved ones, and I understand that, don't, don't blame them. Uh, they're also very mad at Hamas, by the way. They're today for the first time that I have seen anywhere in the world, uh, there were uh, pro-Palestinian people who with this this was within Gaza, rallying, not a big group, looked like about a hundred, uh, saying, Hamas, this is your fault. You need to give up and release the hostages, as opposed to what the rest of the world is demanding, which is a ceasefire uh, and on Israel's part because of the horrific losses of Gaza civilians. So my view on the strategic side is that you might be right. Um, people here have skin in the game, and it's true that in after times of violence, you might overreact and in a moment of emotion or passion, do something that could make things worse in the future. We waited three weeks to invade Gaza. I don't think it was such a hot headed response. Um, we may have been unrealistic. We may have been un, uh, overly optimistic about what might be achieved and what it would take. But uh, I think strategically, the idea here is to, is to force the people who perpetrated October 7th to pay a horrific price, not the civilians, I don't believe that they are to blame. I don't like this argument that says they voted for Hamas in 2006. I hate that argument. I think that's grotesque. 
Uh, I don't think you should be, you deserve a death sentence because of a vote you cast that may not have, you had no idea what was coming. It would be absurd to call those people morally culpable. Um, yes, when bodies of probably dead, naked, semi-naked women were taken into the streets of Gaza City, large groups of people cheered and, and enjoyed it. But so what? That, that's a few hundred people. It's not 25,000. I just, I don't find that morally compelling at all, that argument that says they lost the right to be, uh, to, to life because they were celebrating it. It wasn't the people. Some people hate that, um, that argument. So that's, that's a rough idea of what I would, I would say in response. So I'm going to, before, there's a lot more to say on both pieces of it, but why don't you respond to what I've said so far? Okay. Um, uh... Starting with uh, just uh, you know relatively small scale characterizations of the situation, you made that um, some people might uh, contest. Uh, you you said uh, well, there was a little thing where you um, you know in in terms of this uh, the death of these uh, twenty or so Israeli soldiers yesterday. This is a minor thing, but but I, I think you said it's because we hadn't flattened the buildings that the buildings collapsed. Well, no, but they were preparing to flatten the buildings with explosives uh, because they want to create a buffer zone inside of Gaza. Now, some people have suggested that's a war crime. You know, Gaza is not a, not a big place. So you, you, you create a half a mile, uh, you know, uh, you know, buffer zone the whole way around. You, you, you've cut into 10 percent of uh, of Gaza. Um you, you said uh, that you waited three weeks to to invade. That's true, but the bombing began earlier, and I know it was it was before that that I looked at the numbers, and I saw that in the last week they had dropped six thousand bombs on a place that's slightly larger than Queens, New York, and that's when I that was probably the first time I, I tweeted critically about the assault itself. Um, and, and I think, you know, you mentioned the rules of engagement. I I have read, even in the Israeli press, that the rules of engagement are actually looser this time around than, than in past incursions, certainly looser than Americans use. If you look at uh, the way Americans have gone through cities, number of airstrikes, number of civilians lost, all those indicators suggest that when Americans went through cities in Iraq, uh, they were more willing to take casualties themselves uh, to avoid civilian casualties than seems to be the case here. Now, the, these are all, you know, things we, we probably shouldn't. Uh, let's stipulate that you probably don't agree with any of that. And if you want to get back to it, um, you can. These are um, relatively uh, relatively minor things. Um, to, to get back to... Uh, well, I, I want to say one more thing. Um, I, I think one thing you could say in defense of the Israeli people in the context of the question I ask, but which also can be deployed on behalf of the Gazans is everyone is operating in a different information environment. Uh, these days, everyone is operating in a different information environment. And I don't think that Israelis have seen as much in mainstream media of the carnage in Gaza as Americans have in at least many mainstream media. Uh, it varies in America, but that's my suspicion. Uh, by the same token, you can rest assured that people in Gaza were not hearing, uh, hey, our guys are beheading babies. Our guys are putting babies into ovens now. Of course, those things turned out not to be true, even though uh, Bibi Netanyahu uh, assured President Biden personally that some of them were. Um, and, and I think not, perhaps consequentially, those unfounded claims were still in play in during the formative phase of Israel's psychological reaction. And, you know, uh, but, but in any event, even, even the atrocities that did happen, those were, you know, those were not, I, I don't think those are being, uh, you know, spread far and wide in Gaza by uh, Hamas communications media. So people are operating in very different information environments. Um, the, uh, you know, in terms of you said, well, they started it. Well, of course, uh, that's not the view in Gaza, right? I mean, Correct. Gaza will, and, and, and if you, and if you, and, and they will say, uh, 
they can cite horrible things that have been done to them by Israelis. Now, Israelis can reply, okay, but let's go back another year in history. And let's go back another year. As you know, you eventually get to the late 19th century, literally, right? Yep. With these claims and counterclaims. And I, and this is probably easier for me to see because I don't have a strong tribal affiliation with either side by virtue of my heritage. But I'm constantly struck by the fact that on both sides, people are convinced that they have the original grievance. And I'll, I'll just, you know, um, just, just say that as an observation. Um, I, I would encourage both sides to try to, you know, transcend their perspective. But it's, of course, very hard if you're, yeah. in, either, if you're in either position. Um, the, uh, I, I would say you, you said, uh, something like, well, yes, they're going to hate us. Um, I guess maybe in closing, I'd say, I'm not, I'm not just saying they're going to hate you. I'm going to say, I'm saying they're going to hate you way more than before. And there's going to be a lot of people who are like literally willing to die. Like those Hamas soldiers who went into Israel, a lot of them probably knew there was a real chance they weren't coming back. Yeah. And whatever you want to say about the religion and martyrdom, you know, I, I have been, I was brought up uh, Southern Baptist. I've been in a religion where people think they're going to heaven when they die. Believe me, they still don't want to die. Okay. And they, uh, you know, uh, of course they have the, the sense of, um, you know, that they're doing, that they're serving their people and everything. And that, that drives them as well. But if you want to mobilize a lot of people to join a movement like Hamas and become militants, it really helps if, if, if like their sister is growing up without legs because of an Israeli bomb. That is a huge recruiting asset yep. for Hamas or the next Hamas or whatever. And I think one difference between the way I view this and the way a lot of people in Israel view it is like, I view the hatred in general in extremist movements as uh, being closer to the prime mover than things like the uh, the infrastructure that the leaders of the movement set up to channel the hatred into violence. I saw a really good documentary that was made in 2003 called Death in Gaza. And what's what's good about it is that this is during the occupation phase of Gaza. And, and what's good about it is it actually it actually sustained in a way both of the theories of the case. In other words, it showed uh, the infrastructure. There are these young Hamas militants. And, and one of the creepiest scenes I've ever seen anywhere was when they were, they had a 14-year-old boy who looked like he was 12. And they were kind of encouraging him, you know, there, to not to go out and get killed right now, but to embrace the idea that someday he might be a martyr. It was, it was really creepy. And, and the interviewer uh, challenged them on it. Um, and so there is that infrastructure for channeling hatred into violence. But the other thing you saw in that was like these people were under occupation, uh, which they were no longer literally after whenever 2005 uh, under occupation, but which some people in West Bank still are. And you just saw from the perspective of this kid, well, how could you grow up not hating Israelis? There's just no way. You, 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 you never have a conversation. With, you only see them with guns. They've killed people you know. So um, this is my theory of the case is uh, that the hatred is fundamental. And of course it takes, it's going to take patience. It's a long-term game to try to pursue policies that let the hatred subside and try to build on the, you know, less unfavorable sentiment. Um, that's a very uh, hard, hard thing. Uh, but I personally think uh, it's it's maybe the only thing that works unless you want to do actual ethnic cleansing. And I worry that that may be what happens. Oh, God here. forbid. And, and, I and, yeah, I know. I, I know. I know. I, I want to say one more thing is that and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I worry that I think the Israel it isn't just that most Israelis don't buy my theory of the case. It isn't just that they say it's this it's this institution of Hamas that's implanting the hatred. If we could just get rid of this institution of Hamas. I think, I think a lot of them do think that, but I think it's it's it goes beyond that. Which I, I I think there's this idea in Israel that, and has been for some time. Look, they and I think they almost mean the world. 
but a lot of people in the world, they are going to hate us no matter what we do, right? Whether it's anti-Israel sentiment, anti-Semitism, whatever, I think they think of it as like a universal constant almost. And, and so we might as well play hardball because they're going to hate us no matter what. I will well, say, let me, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll-, I'll uh, There's so many, sure. so many things I want to say, and I, I'm, I'd love to comment briefly so you could react, but it's going to be hard because there's so many great things uh, that you said that, that, that I feel um, differently about, so I want to be clear. Um, let's start with the point that I was trying to go sort of in reverse order. Uh, yes, Jew hatred goes back a long way. Uh, so yes, there is a feeling here that they're going to hate us anyway, uh, especially because part of their religion seems to believe that Jews uh, should be killed. That's not good. Um, and we do feel it. And certainly on October 7th, we felt it. And um, so that's part of it. Uh, it's not quite true that the only thing they see are Israelis with guns. Many of the people, unfortunately, who were killed on October 7th were people on the left who were working to encourage cooperation and interaction between Israelis and Gazans. Many of them had, had Gazans working in their villages and towns, um, and they had had permits to cross the border. Uh, there is a belief it could be true that that helped them chart out where they attacked. Uh, many of these people drove Palestinians to hospitals in Israel for medical treatment that was not available in Gaza. There are a lot of hospitals in Gaza we've discovered, real hospitals, not just sham uh, covering up of, of say, uh, terrorist command centers, but there are real hospitals there. They're real doctors. There are quite a few, actually. A lot of people are shocked how many there are and how many doctors there are. Um, but a lot of people drove those folks when there was a treatment they needed that they couldn't get in Gaza. So there were our people and were people and will be people, I hope, in Gaza who don't just see um, airplanes, bombs, and, and soldiers. But your basic point is correct. Uh, and I think one a thoughtful person has to confront the reality that if I live there, I might feel the same way as they do. Um, hatred, desire to kill, desire for vengeance, and so on. And we might come back, I think, I hope we do come back and talk about what do you do with that? How do you break that? Uh, the point you made a minute ago, which I, I'll say something about, about where you start. I, I want to make a meta point first, which is interesting how much we want the moral high ground. I talked about this recently in this episode that hasn't aired yet uh, with uh, Hill Cohen and others made the point before. See, I actually believe that Israel has been less destructive than the United States in its wars against uh, civilian populations, say in Mosul and elsewhere in its war against the Islamic State. But here's what's weird. I mean, what kind of a, <laughs> is that the moral exemplar? A lot of people would say, you know, what, what America did in there was horrible. In fact, Israel's a little bit better. And you know, it would be interesting, we're not gonna do it, but it would be interesting uh, for you and I to sit down and, and just look at why I actually think Israel has done a better job in keeping civilian casualties down. It, but in a way, it's kind of, a, again, a, it, it's interesting that I want to believe that. And, and people who don't like Israel's reaction don't want to believe it. But um, I think it's just interesting as human beings, we want to believe that our cause is just. Um, but the only point I would make is that if Israel could do whatever it wanted and had no moral scruples, and didn't care about international opinion. It could have flattened Gaza without any uh, losing a single soldier. We have total control of the airspace. We have a lot more bombs. We didn't have to warn people to leave town. We didn't have to warn people to move to the south. Um, so it is horrible. Yes, those buildings that the 21 soldiers died in yesterday were, were flattened anyway. We could have flattened them from the air though, and we didn't because there's collateral destruction. So, um, Again, I'm not sure how important that is, but I think it's interesting that it feels important, and it feels important to you too, I think, which is, you know, just a human human response. Um, let me try to say something about uh, ending the um, 
this so-called cycle, you made the point of, you know, what year do you start? I said they started it. They did start on October 7th, but of course you're right. There was mistreatment of Gazans before that. Uh, Israelis like to, and defenders of Israel like to point out, Israel withdrew in 2005. You could then debate whether they stayed. They did have some presence there. They did have still military response. They did have a blockade. We had, a, I wasn't here, but we had a blockade. Um, it wasn't an open air prison. That is a, I think, a propaganda line. There are many, many parts of Gaza we have learned. I didn't know this. I thought it was more, it was something like an open air prison. There are many parts of Gaza that on October 6th were beautiful. The uh, parks and villas and beachfront and restaurants and car dealerships. I thought it was all giant slum. Uh, it's not, uh, much of it is, but I blame Hamas for that. Uh, we know now that they took enormous amounts of money and used it to build tunnels. Um, an extraordinary achievement, by the way, engineering achievement, and did it somehow without Israel knowing, despite the so-called you know relentless surveillance, Israel did not do a good job. They didn't do a good job blockading them uh, because Gazans got access to lots of uh, weapons and either they built them or they somehow smuggled them in. Um, so if Israel was preventing Gaza from flourishing, even after we withdrew, it certainly was overcome, at least for military purposes. But I think the deeper question is, and you know, we could spend the um, whole rest of the time just on this. I don't know if we want to, but you know, how do you move forward? Uh, Israelis, there are some who hate Arabs, who, who would like to take vengeance, but the average Israeli just wants to live here. Now, I understand that that phrase, just wants to live here, is a little bit uh, misleading. In the course of doing so, we have a military presence in the West Bank. You call it occupation. It, it, it's certainly, I think that's the right term militarily. Although over the years, we have given increasing control to the Palestinian Authority, just as we have left Gaza, which was a real military occupation. We had, again, men in the streets and and uh, mostly men, probably some women too, uh, with military equipment. And we tried pulling out, didn't help. Uh, could argue it was, so it was too tough on the Gazans. But I think I think the problem is, is that they do seem to have a serious number of people who are hateful to the point of, as you say, and this is the key point, willing to sacrifice themselves to kill the enemy. And why do they only feel that about Israel and the Jews? You know, there are many, many people who are abused uh, in the Arab world. Palestinians have been abused in many, many times by the Jordanians, by the Lebanese, by many others. But they don't harbor a deep, hateful uh, feeling toward those folks. They don't sacrifice their lives. They put that down and moved on. We're different. And we, meaning Israel and the Jews. Now, when you say, how far back do you want to start? You said you could go back to the 19th century. I think we should at least go back to 1948. We should at least talk about that as to how, you know, some of these enmities uh, populated and, and got created. But uh, I think if we say, what about going forward? The optimism I have, and it is limited, is, is I would say, uh, a, a, a couple of places to be optimistic. Uh, one is, I like to believe, perhaps not true, that most human beings simply want to have better lives for themselves and their children. I understand overlaying that sometimes is religious beliefs, including fanatical extremist religious beliefs on all sides, in all religions at various times in history. But I like the idea that perhaps if Gazans had more autonomy as citizens, they would be less hateful or more willing to not sacrifice their life because that is something else to live for. Uh, it certainly seems to be the case for Arab Israelis. That Two million Arabs live with full rights here in Israel, not Palestinians. And uh, they're very supportive. I think the number 70% of what's of, of, the, of the Jewish state and, and the right of Israel to defend itself, they don't want to live under Hamas. <laughs> Hamas is a tough, corrupt, hateful, dead end um, for unless you want to be a martyr. It's really good at that. So my hope is that the people who do want a good life for their children and themselves would have the opportunity to voice that belief. They don't now, particularly because they could be killed. Um, it's not a tolerant regime either in the West, nor is it in the West Bank. Um, so that's one source of optimism. 
I do like an idea that if we could talk about our different narratives, perhaps we could understand why we hate each other. And maybe if we respected each other's narratives, we could understand that this problem is not easily resolved. And we'd have to make some sacrifices. Um, and um, part of me just says, and this maybe is unattractive to hear, but we live here. We've made our lives here. More than that, we have built a country that is has a very nice standard of living. It could do a better job with some of its populations, but we can work on that. But we built a good country that is a haven for Jews in a world that is often hostile to Jews. And we're going to fight to preserve it. And we understand that if our neighbors don't like it, we're in a bad neighborhood, but we're going to fight to keep it. And um, it doesn't excuse immorality. It doesn't justify immorality, but we will defend ourselves. And we see this in Gaza as defense. Again, maybe it's too harsh. Maybe it's not proportionate enough or could be better. But we see a lot of the moral shortcomings on the Hamas side. Um, so it's hard for us to see the other narratives. So I invite you uh, as a non-tribalist, and it's beautiful that you're we're having this conversation, I invite you to make that case and, and respond to anything else I said. Again, sorry I went so long. Just you said okay, so many and, interesting and the, things. The case is, uh, what case is it you're inviting me to make, just so I'm clear? Well, I think most, most on October 6th, most uh -huh. Gazans lived bad, li unpleasant lives. Some of that was due to Israel, but a lot of it was due to Hamas. Um, on October 8th and after, uh, or the 9th, 10th, whenever the bombing did start, and I, it's a great point you made, the ground invasion was three weeks later, but we did start bombing one before that. That's a great point, an example of my tribal bias. Um, I think life in Gaza has gotten worse. And I blame Hamas, <laughs> and, and so do some Gazans. It's like, didn't you think this was going to happen? Did you really think that that Israel was going to just do a token response to having eleven hundred people killed, dozens raped, and and their people kidnapped? You think they were just going to say, "Well, that that's not good"? You know, we spent five years, five years with a single soldier in captivity, Gilad Shalit, that was a remarkably unforgotten just relentlessly remembered tragedy mm -hmm. until finally the government gave up Gilad Shalit for a thousand, one soldier mm -hmm. who had been captured and kidnapped, a thousand well, I, I Palestinian actually, prisoners, I including actually, Sinwar, who, yeah. whose life we saved from a brain tumor when he was a prisoner in Israel in an Israeli hospital and who's the architect and mastermind of the October 7th attack. So, you know, we could have lost a lot of our patients. Maybe we should be better. But we kind of had it. And so there, there is a resolve here that we have the right to defend ourselves. I actually think that uh, Gilad Shalit may be one of the reasons that, that uh, Hamas thought the response would not be this strong. Uh, right. I think they thought, oh, you'll give us a thousand prisoners for one guy. Well, what if we have a couple hundred people? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I honestly think. I thought at the time when I heard them, that they were trading a thousand prisoners for one guy, I thought this is crazy. I mean, look at the precedent you're setting. But whatever, leave that insane. aside. That um, was a bad strategic. Move, yeah, well, we just game theoretically. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the um. So okay. So as for, I, I'm certainly not going to say you know. Well, Hamas was justified in attacking. I want to emphasize whenever I try to explain why something happened, I'm not excusing it. Uh, I try to understand on both sides why people have done things. This isn't about justifying uh, anything. Um, the, uh, but with that said, let me let me start again with some relatively. Can I interrupt, uh, Bob? Sure. Can I interrupt for one sec? Yeah, you're unusual. I agree with you. I, I'm certainly capable. I like to think I'm capable of understanding something without justifying it. But you're rare in the loud echo chambers of social media and on the streets. A lot of people have not just tried to understand October 7th. They've justified it, right? So that's, I just want to say that I think that's important. For our conversation, I accept your point. But it's not the common view. A lot of people think um, it was a good, it was just what was done. And I part of it, by the way, is what you right. said. But, but, it, work, it, works, but 
it works both ways. I mean, I understand that it's human nature for Israel, given what happened on October 7th, to, uh, to do what they did. I mean, you know, as I've often said, I I've long been a critic of Israel's behavior, for starters, in the sense that I don't think it's wise. But I've always said they're, no, they're, they're not reacting any cr more crazily than America reacted to 9-11. But I was arguing against that, too. Pe people <laughs> can Google a piece I wrote in September of 2001, a week and a half after 9-11, about uh, why it doesn't make sense to obey your retributive impulse uncritically. The piece is called Feels So Good in Slate. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've tried to be consistent about this now. O on, the, on the broader point of uh, conflating, explaining with justifying, which again, I think applies to both sides. It's human, it's literally human nature to do that. We all do that. It takes effort. It takes effort to try to listen to someone explain why your adversary did something without screaming at them. Oh, so you're justifying it. So you're absolving them of blame. That takes, you know, but I think if we want to understand why these things happen, we have to, we have to um, work to do that. I've already endured one round of this over Ukraine whenever I try to explain why I think uh, uh, Russia invaded and how in some respects, uh, if American foreign policy had been better, it might not have happened. Um, so uh, let me, uh, uh, again, take some of the uh, maybe not more, uh, more critical points you made, but quickly when you said, well, uh, I had said all, all the Gazan kids see is Israelis with guns. You said, well, it isn't Israelis with guns and uh, just Israelis with guns. It's true. You can point to Israelis doing very laudable work and you can point to kinds of interactions that happen. I'm just saying for the average kid in Gaza, they didn't see any of that. They, they, you know, they, they, they're just, by the time you're 15 or 16, your worldview Fair is enough. starting to crystallize. All you've seen is that they're enemies and you can name a cousin that died or was maimed. And, and now again, now it's a brother or sister this time around. Uh, the, um, so uh, you mentioned open air prison. I think one thing people mean by that, it's not that there are no nice places in Gaza or were, um, it's that they can't leave. Now they can get special permission to go to a hospital, blah, 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 but it's a very small area. And it mm. seems to all of us pretty strange to grow up in a city, again, slightly larger than Queens, New York. You can't leave for your whole life, okay? If, if you don't like it there, tough luck. Um, and again, the other part of the open air prison metaphor is that Israel does control the flow of materials into Gaza. Uh, you know, Israelis say, well, but it's all about keeping weapons out. Yeah, but it gets, it's not just weapons per se, it gets complicated. There are limits on how far the fishing boats can go. I don't want to get into it, but, but open air prison doesn't just mean they all live in cells and, and, and uh, have concrete floors. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, have, on the West Bank, have they ceded uh, more control to Palestinian Authority? They did as part of the Oslo process. Still, Israel has the right to go into any place in the West Bank. Uh, and, and they have on some occasions. And once they go in, they're in charge. They can do what they want. Palestinians, the West Bank, do not have due process of law. Uh, they go to a military court with an exceedingly high conviction rate. And whatever the soldier who brings them in says... Uh, is taken a, a, as as the decisive evidence, by and large, as I understand the way those courts um, work. Of course, they're not allowed to vote. And, you know, I know I'm now I'm inching uh, toward kind of big issues that it, it would take you a long time to respond to. And I don't uh, I don't mean to before I get back to something larger. You can uh, write this down if you want. But, you know, it's often said, well, Israel is a, is a democracy. It's a beacon of democracy. And and. I don't know. I would just say, look, you know, you are ruling the West Bank. And, uh, and uh, the rule in the West Bank is if you're Jewish, you get to vote. If you're Palestinian, you don't. And of course, the, the, uh, the indignities inflicted on Palestinians by the occupation go well beyond that. Absolutely. Um, I and, agree with you, Bob. And uh, so, Again, I hate to do these kind of drive-by shootings, bringing up these like major issues that you should, in theory, have a, a PhD dissertation to respond to. But I, I, I do want to uh, just now, before throwing it back, you get back to this um, 
the whole thing about, well, we tried withdrawing from Gaza. We've seen withdrawal doesn't work. Um, I will, leaving aside the question whether you, you call that kind of a good faith withdrawal. In other words, was it designed to work? You know, there was no, there's a lot of things you could say about that. And about what the motivation was, was the motivation, I think part of the motivation was just to change the demographic equation. Say, hey, we're not responsible for these guys. So if worse comes to worse, and the world somehow forces us to let all Palestinians vote or something, we've still got a huge majority. It was, I, I think it was partly about that. But the main thing I want to bring up is about the uh, rarely told uh, in the media story about what happened after the uh, election that brought Hamas to power. And this, uh, you know, I, I listened to your podcast with Marty Friedman, who's at AP, and uh, he was saying on balance, uh, Western, well, I think he would, I think his view is that on balance, Western media coverage is biased against Israel. I disagree. Uh, as part of that, he was talking about his own experience within Associated Press. That I can't speak to. Maybe AP is biased. I haven't kept track. But he did say one thing that seems to me to illustrate actually a kind of bias uh, th uh, that you find in favor of Israel in uh, U.S. media. And here's what he said. I wrote it down. He said, in 2006, the Palestinians have an election in Gaza and the West Bank. And that election is won by Hamas. In 2007, Hamas, in a kind of violent coup, gets rid of the remnants of the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and takes over Gaza. And in the following year, 2008, there's a real war which involves rockets fired. Now, one might ask, if they won the election, why would they have to stage a coup? And that's an excellent question. And I would encourage people to read a piece I wrote for the Non-Zero Newsletter called The Truth About Hamas. Let me summarize uh, what happened. So the Bush administration insisted on, elect on letting Hamas run in the elections. I, I don't think the Israeli government was so enthusiastic about that, but it happened. The Bush administration said, sure, Hamas can run. Hamas won. They didn't get a majority of the vote, but they did win control of the legislative council, which at that point had control of like finance and national security. So it was kind of uh, quasi parliamentary in its implications, if you will. If you control the legislature, you, you largely control the government for both Gaza and the West Bank. Bush administration said that's unacceptable. So they, um, they, encouraged Fatah to stage a coup, even to the point of apparently, and people can read the piece, some of this stuff's a little fuzzy, but funneling weapons to Fatah through Egypt. So the Bush administration basically started that civil war. I don't think Fatah was chomping at the bit, honestly, but the Bush administration wanted it to happen. It happened. Um, and so there was a civil war. and. In the middle of it, uh, Saudi Arabia said, wait a second, can we work something out? They convened, uh, you know, officials from the Palestinian Authority, from, you know, uh, uh, Hamas, from, from everybody. And, and they worked out a deal that uh, Hamas signed on to, Abbas signed on to, and the deal was going to be unified government for the West Bank and uh, Gaza. And let me quote uh, Khalid Mishal, who was the leader of Hamas. Uh, you know, first of all, they agreed, Hamas agreed on paper, they would abide by the Oslo Accords and other existing tr treaties between the PLO and Israel. They would support negotiations over a two state solution. Um, uh, Mishal said, quote, Hamas is adopting a new political language. The Mecca agreement is a new political language, and honoring the agreements is a new language because there's a national need and we must speak a language appropriate uh, to the time. Uh, the, the Bush administration in Israel further demanded uh, that they recognize the state of Israel. Now, at that point, most Arab nations hadn't done that. that. That was asking for like a 180 degree, exceedingly politically difficult thing for Hamas, let's just say. And I think it was designed to kill the deal. And we will never know what would have happened if, if, if we had followed up on that. You don't know. And again, it gets back to the theories of the case about whether Hamas is this thing with essence of evil implanted in it and it can never be, uh, uh, you know, uh, erased. Or you think, well, these are people, they like things like social status 
and suddenly Khalid Mishal is is being is a globally significant figure. Maybe you can steer him, uh, you know, to, to toward a, a particular channel to to further elevate his status. Who knows? My point is, time and again, it seems to me uh, we have not picked up on we have not explored the hypothesis that moderation is uh, possible. Not just with Hamas, but I would say more broadly. You know, people often say. Where is the Palestinian Martin Luther King? Well, when you ask the Palestinians, they say, well, every time that we see one, Israel puts him in jail. And look, given what we know about Bibi Netanyahu, I don't doubt that a bit. He, by his own account, he has spent his political career trying to sabotage a two-state solution. He is totally upfront about it, and he's been the prime minister for the last two years. So, um, you know, I, I, I want, you know, and, and I could, I'm trying to make two points with this. I, first of all, I, I want to push back on the claim made in, in your podcast with Marty Friedman that by and large, uh, Western media is biased uh, against um, uh, against Israel because his, Marty Friedman, he's a journalist. His account of things is the standard account that's prevailed. And I just think it's, it's, it's uh, flat out wrong. In, in fact, David Wormser, a neocon who, in the Bush administration, who opposed the uh, fomenting the coup, uh, bless his heart, uh, is is a neocon who actually abides by the professed principle of uh, of democracy promotion. And so he was against the coup, and he said, "Look, it was the opposite." He said, "We we tried to start a coup, and it failed. That that's uh, what happened." So, and I and I could I could explore this thesis of uh, pro Israel uh, media bias by reference to the common claim that the Palestinians uh, rejected a state that was offered them. Which I don't think a true state was ever offered them. I don't, uh, and I, I actually happened upon. I had forgotten about a piece I wrote in two thousand two for Slate called "Was Was Arafat the Problem," uh, which lays out my view of that. But I, I do contest. I strongly contest the views that the media is biased. Uh, by and large, American media is biased in favor of um, of Israel and. Uh, I, I mean, in, in, I, I think it is it is biased in favor of Israel, and um, and I want to say that I think time and time again, we have really not truly explored uh, the possibility of moderation. I don't know if it would have worked, but we we I, in my view we keep failing to find out. So there's a lot there. I, yeah. I doubt I ever got around to ask uh, answering your actual question, but that's all right. No, that was really interesting. Um, let me respond to a few of the points. Um, my understanding, which might be wrong, uh, again, I think it's useful for listeners who are not as deeply immersed in these issues. They do often get a soundbite summary, like "Well, Israel withdrew in two th withdrew in two thousand and five," but they don't hear what we did after that. So, to be fair. You need the full picture, I'm trying to share that with you, my listeners on Econ Talk, as much as possible. Uh, I take the points uh, about it's hard to be a Gazan. Uh, most of them, you're right, don't leave. Some do. They get they they get out through Egypt and they can travel the world and they come back and they certainly can get out for medical treatment, but it doesn't matter. It's still hard to live there. I don't disagree with any of that. But I think just to say something historical about 2005, uh, in 2005, there were Israeli Jewish settlements in Gaza. And they were a thorn in the side of Gazans, whether they should have been or not, is irrelevant. Um, they were not accepted. And it was very hard for the people who lived in those settlements to enjoy a normal life. And to some extent, the only way they were able to do that was by the presence of the Israeli army. And at some point in 2005, this is, again, my narrative. I, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but my understanding is the reason we pulled out is because our soldiers were getting rocks thrown at them and occasionally getting killed. And the people who lived there were occasionally getting killed. And we said, this is a price not worth paying. And we said, we're withdrawing. And we didn't just withdraw. It's really important for people to understand this. We forcibly ethnically cleansed Gaza of Jews, to say it the most provocative way. We dragged Jewish Settlers, they're called in a disparaging way, but people who are living in places in Gaza, which, you know, historically has been places where Jews have lived in the past. We said, you can't live here anymore. You're, we're taking you out. And the army forcibly evicted people from their homes 
And this was an enormously painful moment for Israel to have the Israeli army forcing Jews to leave for both reasons that there were people here who thought we should be allowed to live in Gaza, but I think more than anything else, the symbolism of it was extremely painful for many Israelis and many Jews around the world, that military force, a Jewish army was being used against Jews. But we did that. We withdrew all the people from those settlements and we didn't allow them to go back in. There's a, a standard narrative that says, and we left all these nice greenhouses uh, that we had built there and the Gazans destroyed them. I don't know if that's true. I have a feeling that there's it, that story has some untruth to it, but I don't know. But that's the way Israelis often and certainly Jews that I know have talked about this withdrawal. And I think the coup part, I'm not going to defend Monty Friedman on this because I don't I let him defend himself. Um, I'll send him a link to this and he can respond in the comments if he wants. But the the point about what I it would not surprise me that the Bush administration armed Fatah to try to beat uh, Hamas because <laughs> the Bush administration encouraged an election. They didn't get the outcome they wanted, huh? Well, that was didn't turn out so well. And then they were probably I wouldn't surprise me if they tried other ways to to overcome that uh, election. And the, the bottom line is, uh, yeah, uh, it is probably not exactly a coup by Hamas. But I think probably what Mati was referring to is the fact that it, there was a lot of brutality after that, uh, those moments. Maybe it's understandable, doesn't matter. I think the Hamas and Fatah, the, the two rival political and military and civil organizations that are active in both the Gaza and the West Bank on the other side, uh, they don't get along. And uh, Gaza took some revenge. I don't think it was merely a military struggle. I think they did some unpleasant things. But put that to the side. I want to comment on some other things you said. It's true that people in the West Bank, when people make the claim that Israel's an apartheid state, uh, Israelis and defenders of Israel point out, ah, oh, but in Israel, Arabs have full rights, they get to vote, they can go to college, they get health care, uh, they can serve in the army, but they usually choose not to. And that's all That's all true. Uh, many Druze uh, serve in the army in Israel proudly, Bedouins do, but is Muslims generally don't, uh, very few. Um, so when critics of Israel call it apartheid state, they say, well, we didn't mean in Israel, we meant in the West Bank. And it's true. The West Bank is very unfair. It's not equal treatment. The Israeli settlers, which is now, I think, around 500,000, I've seen 700,000 is the number, but there's hundreds of thousands of, of Israelis, of Jews who live in the West Bank. Uh, they do vote in Israel. They do have access to Israeli services. And yes, the Israeli army will protect them. And yes, the military courts that are often used uh, against uh, Palestinians in the West Bank are probably not due process. Of course, Palestinian Authority is not a beacon of democracy there either. It's, if Israel pulled out, I don't think they'd live in a democratic heaven, but at least it'd be theirs. And I understand the human impulse for tribal autonomy and, and a feeling that it's your people and your place. So I, I totally understand that. Um, but let's talk about this issue about bias. I think it's really interesting because uh, it's a perfect example where you can cherry pick. I pointed out on, on Econ Talk that um, you know, if you write for the national for the New York Times or you or broadcast for National Public Radio, you get hate mail from both sides. <laughs> you know, the, the the supporters of Israel say that that the New York Times hates Israel's anti-Israel, and the supporters of uh, the Palestinians will say that Israel's pro pro uh, the New York Times is pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian. So I'm sure. It's easy to cherry pick examples, but I think I think for most Jews and certainly Israelis in the aftermath of October 7th, the mainstream media response has been uh, shockingly unsympathetic to the Israeli side. At least that's the way I read it. I'm going to make a little bit of the case and let you respond. Um, most couple dramatic examples. There's a bombing of a hospital early in the war, very early. Uh, reports from the Washington Post, New York Times, the two most respected American newspapers, along with maybe the Wall Street Journal. Uh, those two papers uh, immediately said um, that 500 people have been killed. And they, there were quotes, the Times had a video up for a while. I can't find it anymore. But it showed a doctor saying, I've never seen a, a scene like this, the bodies, the, and it was not true. 
Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, it wasn't Israel. It was almost certainly a Palestinian, a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that had done the damage. It didn't kill 500. It didn't hit the hospital. It landed in the parking lot. The New York Times ran a picture of the destroyed hospital. It wasn't actually the hospital. It was a different building. Uh, all done overnight without, now there's pressure of wartime coverage. You could maybe say it was, they were trying to get to press, but it really soured a lot of people here on that. Uh, Monty Friedman worked for the Associated Press for five years between 2006, 2011. Most of his comments in my episode with him were about that experience, where basically Hamas in those years controlled coverage. There are no real journalists in Gaza. Uh, if you report something that's un embarrassing to the regime, you're not going to be allowed to keep reporting. They'll either kill you or threaten you or stop you. Uh, and his examples were things like they wouldn't let you film certain casualties coming into the hospital. But more importantly, he was working out of the Jerusalem uh, office of the Associated Press, the Jerusalem Bureau. Stories that were sympathetic to Hamas got ran, sympathetic stories that were critical, they wouldn't run. That's his take. Baby's wrong. There's a nice back and forth. We posted links to it. You can, you know, you can follow that and, and read the, the people who disagreed with Monty and tried to defend AP and whether you agree with that or not, you can take a look. Um, you know, think about how the world has responded, both the press and others, to the um, accusations of rape against Hamas on October 7th and any other Gazans who came in on that day. I mean, we have videos of a lot of this. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I think the, they, they did the, behead some people. Rapes, I don't know if they beheaded the babies. Rapes and, of the rapes themselves? But, I'm just curious because I've heard that contested. But of the rapes themselves? Say, say that again. Are there uh, videos of the rapes themselves? Now, I don't know about that. There's a 47 minute. Uh, here's what we have video that I've seen. And I'm just a casual consumer of this on X on Twitter. Um, you know, there's a woman dragged out of a, it's a horrific photo, a woman dragged out of being dragged out of a, a Jeep or car. Mm -hmm. Her um, Achilles tendon has been cut so she can't run away. Her sweatpants are bloody uh, around her mid in her midsection. It's a it's grotesque. Um Maybe she wasn't violated. I don't know. But the 47-minute uh, video that it, that was put together that has not been shown publicly out of respect for the victims, I think, is more graphic. But certainly there are many, many, many women who either saw rape or reported rape and have not been believed by okay. lots of people. Um, yeah, I don't, mean, I don't mean to contest this claim. I'm just curious because I've been vaguely aware of arguments about how direct the evidence is. I haven't had the it's time to look point. into it. I was curious, but it's but a fair fine. point. I don't. I didn't mean yeah. to suggest you're you're a skeptic, or yeah. but I do think that that that's a fair point. I I do think, however, that what has been publicly available since October seventh about the brutality of what happened that day, including beheadings, maybe not of children, uh, or the burning of children. I I think those are. I'm not sure those are refuted, by the way. It's a perfect example of where our own biases are, are in play here. Um, but there was quite a bit broadcast by the perpetrators, by the people who did these acts in pride and delight and joy. It's, um, it's a heartbreaking uh, betrayal of humanity, in, in my view. But many of those things are simply not believed or, or were treated with a level of skepticism. And the idea that you could have, even now, 136 people who've been in hostage for, I think, 109 days without any a visit from the Red Cross, without any international pressure. And I'm just going to throw this in because it infuriates me, and certainly not from the UN. There's no, there was no condemna condemnation of October 7th from the Palestinian Authority. I, th I don't think there still has been one. I don't think there has been one yet. Uh, I think the UN women's organizations made a very lukewarm condemnation months after the, the sexual violence of October 7th. One of the stranger, strangest things about this crisis is the role of Qatar. Uh, Qatar houses and hosts much of the leadership of Hamas. They have been the sort of good faith mediator and, and the um, first ceasefire maybe the last, we'll see, but certainly the first ceasefire that allowed 100 or so hostages to get out and uh, hundreds of Palestinian prisoners to be released from prison. But Qatar is treated like a normal country. There's no pressure on Qatar. There's no pressure on Qatar to say, uh, you have given 
uh, shelter to some of these this wickedness. Uh, Qatar has donated, I think, three billion dollars to American universities over the last, I don't know what the time period is, 10, 20, or 30 years. Doesn't matter. It's a lot of money. No, no American university has said, boy, these are not nice people. We shouldn't take their money and we should return it. Or we will never take money from them again until they uh, turn over these the masterminds of this project. Or uh, since they seem to have a lot of say in this now, could they at least get the Red Cross to at least see if these people are alive and should be getting medication. No, nope, not a word. So that's kind of the reason I think this this sequence of the media coverage, the UN, the Red Cross, Qatar and how they're treated, all of these create in Israelis and in many Jews a feeling that we're kind of not getting the fairest treatment. I agree with you. Historically, there's been plenty of bias against Palestinian cause. There's a certain natural connection between Americans and the Jewish story, partly because there are more Jews in, in America than there are Palestinians, partly because there is a democratic underpinning of it and there's a certain connection. But lately, we don't feel like it's been so even handed. Okay. Um, well, I certainly agree, uh, first of all, that Post-October 7th, I mean, the, the first thing I witnessed was an outpouring of support and sympathy for Israel. Uh, that did not last very long, at least not without being diluted by uh, a reaction of a very different kind, which I think to some extent uh, was, you know, due to how rapidly massive bombing began. I'm not, I'm not trying to justify it. I'm just saying I think that's the causal sequence of events. And world opinion has now turned, uh, you know, very much against uh, Israel. There was a morning consult poll. They, they periodically poll like 40-something countries. And Israel's net favorability overall in these countries, the average, um, has dropped by something like 18 points in between late September and now. So th there's, no, there's no doubt about about that, and I think that is largely a response to what you know how the how the uh, assault on Gaza now is being covered, rightly or wrongly. Uh, again, I think it's it's uh, it is a devastating assault. I'm not happy about the fact that my tax dollars are going to pay for it uh, at all. But leave all that aside. Uh, there's no there's no doubt that there's been that shift, kind of opinion. And the other thing is that. I think October 7th revealed something that has been happening slowly in American politics, which is that younger uh, liberals, including younger Jews, have a very different view of the Israel thing than the, the, their, uh, their parents did. And that's, you know, something with uh, which will follow, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and is... Uh, uh, I, I don't know how politically consequential it is yet. It do, it hasn't swayed Joe Biden particularly, but um, but it's there and it's interesting. The um, uh, the uh, quickly on just kind of uh, Cutter, uh, you know, I, I think there is some people would say there. Well, first of all, Bibi Netanyahu, right, is again so has supported in the past apparently the transfer of money from Qatar to Hamas because he wants to sabotage a two-state solution. He has said as much himself. Now, I personally think separate from that, th th there is value, however loathsome you find the leader of the enemy, I think there is value in having a place where conversation can take place to resolve situations like the one we have now, which may lead to the hostages released, among other things. So, so there's that. Um, it's true that the, that hospital strike, which turned out to be apparently an errant Palestinian missile that didn't hit the, uh, the, the hospital per se, although it killed some people because uh, people had congregated around hospitals for safety. Um, yeah, the, the media coverage was rapid. I, I think if you look at it, they'll say they attributed it to whoever was making the claim. Uh, I would I would say similar same thing with the with the beheaded babies that that circulated rapidly was accepted uncritically in America. If you look at the fine print, they were probably attributing it to the Israelis who made the claim. So they didn't. In both cases, the journalism was technically sound. You report what important people are saying. Um, 
But I, I think that works both ways. Now, in terms of uh, media bias, I would, uh, I would emphasize how subtle I think it could be. And I'd like to uh, draw attention to at least one subtle cognitive bias uh, that I think you see at play sometimes. So uh, back whenever, like 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever, I was writing an online column for the New York Times. And uh, there was some kind of reception at the time in the Times building or something that I went to. And I got to talking to an editor on the foreign desk. And I said, you know, I've noticed something. Uh, your, your Jerusalem bureau chief, when he reports like bad things that uh, BB Net and Yahoo does, you know, kind of things that aren't going to play that well in the American media, he seems to take pains within a few paragraphs to describe the political constraints that seem to make it hard for him to do otherwise. Mm. I said, you know, Palestinian, when the Palestinian leadership does bad things, there's no reference uh, to the political constraints on them. And he said, yeah, yeah, we've noticed that. And I said, well, so wait, it, this is okay, like a systematic bias? And he said, look, I don't run this paper. So mm. the New York Times was aware of this. And I want to talk about the cognitive bias because it is so underplayed. It's called attribution error. And the way it works in its, in its full form is when your friends or enemies do something bad, you, ex you ex I mean, your friends or allies do something bad, you explain it away with circumstantial, you know, situational factors. My daughter, my daughter didn't get a nap, right? Whereas the kid who hit her on the playground is just a bully. You know, when it's your enemy or your adversary, you you explain it in essentialist terms, in, in terms of their basic character, the basic disposition, okay? Uh, and, and when they do good things, it's the opposite. When your enemies do something good, well, it seems to be good, but there's actually a reason it, it, it is not reflective of them, and, and it works the other way with your, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I said that right. When your enemies do something good, it is not taken as reflective of their character. Um, I, I think if you pay attention, this is everywhere. It drives conflict everywhere. And I think it was on display in that case. And I doubt uh, that the bureau chief was even thinking about it. Okay, he wasn't doing it on purpose. You just naturally, he was identifying more with the Israeli government than with the Palestinians. Now, uh, there's, there's a second uh it's kind of a cognitive bias, but are you familiar with the term security dilemma in political science? Okay, so it refers to a tendency uh, to when the enemy or adversary um, does something for defensive purposes, some deployment of military force, development of a weapon system, whatever, they may have defensive in mind and you interpret it as offensive. Now, that may be a misreading of intent. You may think you're going to attack, or it may just be that you understand it's defensive for now, but you you can't, um, you just say, well, yeah, but if they develop that capability. I mean, the, the you know, Russia's foreign minister said to Bill Burns, I think in 2008, said, look, we understand you don't plan to use NA uh, Ukraine to attack, but we can't let NATO and Ukraine because we don't know what the next administration will be. So that is also, that's not a misreading of intent, but that's also an example of security dilemma. And you get these spirals of, oh, that's offensive or has offensive potential. So we have to do something defensive, then that is misread as offensive and so on. So anyway, this is backdrop for the fact that I wrote a piece for The Intercept called, uh, some years ago called, How the New York Times is Making War, war with Iran More Likely. And I argued that they view things that Iran may well see as defensive as offensive. The Times just reports them that way, the way Israel would see them. And they don't report uh, Israel's attacks on Iranian proxies or assassination of nuclear scientists, whatever, uh, in the same terms. They view that, they, they depict that as defense. That was my argument, at least. And, and but, I want to say, say just one quick thing about something we don't have time to get into today, but it, it, it has become relevant with this whole Harvard con controversy, which is the policing of speech around the Israel issue, okay? So that piece in the, uh, that I did in The Intercept, uh, it wasn't about Jews. It wasn't about Zionism even. 
It wasn't anti-Zionist. It, it, it wasn't uh, anything. So you would think I would not get blowback from the Anti-Defamation League, right? The way I've described the argument, you wouldn't think. But no, Jonathan Greenblatt, president uh, of the uh, ADL, uh, call, called the, uh, the, my piece on, on Twitter illogical at best, uh, biased at worst. Uh, and look, uh, let's see, there are many, oh, blaming, uh, yeah, whatever. So that's not, he's not saying I'm anti Semitic. I get it, but. You know, somebody might ask, wait a second, the head of the ADL is casting aspersions on suggesting this guy's biased? Like, what does that mean? And look, the ADL has done much more direct accusation by way of trying to discredit people who critis criticize Israel. Direct accusation of anti-Semitism. And I don't know how you view this, but on the left, it's just taken for granted that the ADL is uh, effectively part of the Israel lobby. They're, they're, they are, one of their goals is to, is to police speech ar around Israel in the guise of uh, policing speech, you know, uh, around kind of anti-Semitism. And, and I, I throw that in there because I could, I could give you other examples where I, I think that's relevant to what I see as what has historically been, on balance, a pro-Israel bias in uh, mainstream media, though I grant you that, uh, you know, October 7th, ha well, and the Israeli reaction to October 7th have, have, have collectively revealed something that's changing significantly in America, and we'll see how it plays out. So a lot there. Let me, let me try to respond to it. Um, I think the security dilemma is a deep insight, and it's partly, uh, there's a piece of that insight that I think is, is often missed. Uh, you didn't mention it. Maybe you've thought about it. But intent on the part of a nation is kind of a meaningless idea. And it's a way that we attribute things to our enemies and our friends that make us feel good. Um, leaders can have intent, individual politicians, kind of. <laughs> it gets back to your point about political constraints. We don't know when someone says their reason for why they're doing it, whether it's the actual reason, whether it's what they want the public to believe. So I think that whole thing is a way that we exploit uh, information and, and PR to and communication and media to, to advance our causes. I mean, I'll give you an example that I'll be honest about. Uh, if I were Iran, I would work for, on a nuclear weapon for purely defensive reasons. Uh, Israel's got one. Uh, the United States has one, uh, more than one, <laughs> lots of them. And uh, as long as that's the case, Iran is vulnerable to pressure. And I understand why they're working on a nuclear weapon. Of course, I also understand why people who are afraid of it treat it as if it's only offensive. It's only being invoked to uh, created to, to destroy Israel, which I am worried about. It is, I think, a legitimate concern. But I also understand that there's a defensive reason there, too. Um, the attribution bias is a fantastic point that that we often attribute the worst motives to. Well, how would you describe well, it again? It's that, it's that you describe things that uh, are seen as bad, maybe broadly. Everyone agrees they did something bad. If it's your enemy, you describe it as oh, right. a reflection of their character, their basic their disposition. They're not going to change. You're going to keep doing that. If it's an ally or friend, you emphasize the constraints that we're operating on, the behavior, the situa situational versus dispositional is the technical term. It's a great... It's a great insight, and I think it's true. In the case you're talking about, of course, Netanyahu does face really interesting politi political constraints. I would just say for listeners, it is an overwhelming consensus here in Israel that he not be uh, in office in the future. Uh, we understand, everybody here understands that that creates a very unhealthy incentive system for him with respect to this war. Um, and there may come a point where even though we are at war, he will be uh, forced to step down. Uh, that can happen through the democratic process, not a coup. Uh, if only a few members of his own party uh, decide to leave the coalition, uh, there will be that will trigger elections. And I think Bibi's also very aware of that. So he's uh, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, it's a rock and a hard place, overwhelmingly of his own making. He will be judged by history, at least within this country, as having failed unimaginably badly on October 7th. It will, most of the blame will fall on him. And in my view, correctly so. Um, he had one job. 
he failed. More than that, it was his overwhelming political essence. His whole political popularity was built on the fact that he would make Israel secure, and he failed. I think he knows that. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how that turns out, but that's uh, a side issue. So your point about, you know, about whether the New York Times are reporting his decisions would report political constraints. Of course, there are some. Now, mm -hmm. does it mean they were decisive, as you point out? I think that's really a fantastic insight. And similarly, the fact that Hamas or the PA doesn't operate in a democratic uh, environment, I think that would be the natural reason that people wouldn't invoke political constraints, but they still have them. They, every, um, you know, one of my favorite lines that came from, my, I read it from uh, political scientist John Mueller. He said, um, Mexico is a democracy 364 days a year. This was written, you know, 25 years ago, say 30 years ago. What's the one day it's not a democracy? Election day, because the PRI wins every time. Yeah. But the rest of the year, when there are no elections, the PRI is still subject to political forces and democratic yeah. influences from the people, yeah. even though it's not the normal route of an election. It's you know, a deep there's, insight, a line, I think. there's a line Tom, I heard from Tom Friedman, which is, uh, nobody does more public opinion polling than authoritarian leaders. <laughs> they, they live in fear of sure. uh, because they, because they know they're not legitimate. But anyway, go ahead. So uh, I, I agree with you very much that speech on campuses and in the streets of America and England and elsewhere in the West is uh, complicated, and we've moved very much toward uh, an unhealthy attitude toward speech. Unfortunately, how students and faculty talk about Israel is only the latest chapter of that. The response to it has been somewhat repressive, agreed. But of course, it was repressive before that in different directions. So I wrote a piece, The Dilemma of the West, I, it, I, we'll put a link up to it, where I tried to argue that the challenge is, if you believe in free speech, uh, what do you do about the fact that on October 8th in Sydney, Australia, which is a lovely tolerant place, uh, as is most of the country, there was a large crowd of people chanting, gas the Jews near the Sydney Opera House. And Jews were told, don't go near there, it's not healthy. So well, how does the West, and it's happened in America many times, there'll be a pro-Palestinian rally and the uh, police or the government will say, the mayor will say, don't go over there, it's not safe, we can't protect you. That's awkward. Um, but my general view, by the way, is that people should be allowed to say, free Palestine, they should be allowed to say from the river to the sea. What they shouldn't be allowed to do is chant it in large angry mobs and, and end up barricading people in buildings who are afraid for their lives. Now, maybe we should deal with that in a different way, but uh, I make it, I personally make a, a distinction between having an opinion, for example, that there should not be a Jewish state, but that's a legitimate opinion. Having an opinion, certainly that you can certainly argue in a classroom, you should be able to argue in a classroom that Israel is uh, immoral or has acted horribly in Gaza. That's not anti-Semitic. I think you should, I don't think you're anti-Semitic, Bob. Uh, I think it's important for Jews, <laughs> very important for Jews, that, that people do not squelch speech. Uh, at the same time, Jews often report, perhaps untruthfully, but I think it's true, they're uncomfortable saying things in support of Israel in classrooms at certain universities. So. I, I think there is a, the dilemma is that speech should be open, I think on campuses on all sides for all views, but speech and the threat of violence or mob behavior is, is I would make a distinction. That's, that's just, that's my view. Uh, I'm an American taxpayer like you are. I agree. I do not think American taxes should go towards supporting Israel. Right now, <laughs> Israel gets, I think, three to, before the war, three to $4 billion a year. It's all with strings. It has to be spent on American military equipment. Americans say, yeah, it's good for America, it creates jobs. I think it's bad for America. I think it's bad for Israel. I think that should end. That started decades ago when Israel was a relatively poor country, relatively rich country now. We should not be relying on the United States. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I agree that Bibi bears some of the burden of Qatar's um, strengthening of Hamas. He's at least, I think he has said so. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's true. Um, 
And um, I think that's all. That's all for now. Okay. Um, the uh, on the uh, on the river to the sea. I mean, first of all, the way I would uh, I would just say angry mobs that trap people are bad, whether they're saying any given thing or not saying anything. I think most of people most people who chant from the river to the sea don't know what it means. That's uh, important. I that's important. I, I, well, <laughs> it, I wouldn't say it's that they don't know what it means. It's that meaning is uh, is not a fixed thing. They have a different conception of what it means. I agree. Better, uh, much better and, said. And uh, but I want to emphasize that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, my daughters have been to some uh, pro ceasefire demonstrations. By the way, they go with friends who are mainly Jewish. You know, that matters. Again, it reflects something that, that's going on here. Uh, and, um, and you know, I, I asked them, well, what, what do you think about what other people think? It, it, it means a variety of things to these people. Almost none of them are thinking kill all the Jews or kill all the Jews in Israel. or, or and, and many of them aren't thinking eliminate Israel, eliminate the Jewish state. Some of them mean, look, let all Palestinians vote, okay? Uh, would that lead... Uh, to a Palestinian state, um, maybe it, it, it depends on how it's set up, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't necessarily lead to an Islamist state. Who knows? I mean, I'm just saying this is the way they think of it. And when they hear Bibi Netanyahu say from the r river to the sea, a phrase which, by the way, is in the original Likud charter, um, they, they ask, they say, well, why should Palestinians find it any less threatening for Israeli Jews to talk about a Jewish state from the river to the sea, then Jews should find it uh, for Palestinians to say kind of, you know, that uh, about a Palestinian state. And of course, you would bring in history and say, well, the original Hamas charter, granted it's been superseded by some other document, the original Hamas charter was flagrantly anti-Semitic uh, and so on. And th there's a lot you can say. I'm just saying uh, most of them, a lot of them don't know that much about the history. And I, I'm just trying to, you know, keep people from freaking out. I understand how given phrases come to be uh, almost traumatic for some people to listen to through history. But, you know, I'd encourage people to bear in mind uh, different people mean different things by this. And also, of course, we are in a social media environment where depending on how your feed works, you are going to be shown the most provocative stuff and you will naturally start thinking it's everywhere. Like you, you can find somebody at one of these demonstrations with a Hamas flag. And I have seen somebody from the Foundation for Defensive Democracies, this ardently pro-Israel and anti-Iran think tank, tweet that and even assert that it's typical, which is just flat out not true. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, but I, I would encourage people to, uh, you know, to 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 keep all of this uh, in mind, I guess uh, I quickly I'd say, I, I'm, uh, you know, it's funny, my, my, my view about supporting Israel, it's not so much an impressionable thing about ever sending any money to Israel. It's, it's in the context of this thing that's going on right now. I just, I just can't bear to but, uh, see what's happening in Gaza and think that literally my tax dollars are paying for it. Right. And, and as an American, I'm going to be held accountable for it. I mean, right. and, and that is that becomes a little bit of a national security threat. I mean, I, uh, you know, if you look at what homegrown terrorism there was after 9-11 and, and when they asked people why they did it, it was almost invariably what you're doing to Muslims in other countries, bombing and so on. So this can come back to haunt us on our soil. It can lead to terrorism against American targets. And again, I think it's bad for Israel. I, I don't I'm not somebody who has to say, well, well. Well, screw Israel. America's got to pursue its interests. In this case, I don't think what Israel is doing is particularly uh, in its interest. There's one more point I could make, uh, but if you want to jump in. Uh, I just want to say one thing about from the river to the sea and pa free Palestine. What, what, what's sad to me and somewhat scary is that, so we here's what we agree on. Uh, there are many, many phrases that have both general, you know, go back to a favorite econ talk concept from uh, Marvin Minsky. They're suitcase words. They're things you can stuff lots of different things into. I'll take intifada for one. The intifada, people chant about the intifada now in many of these rallies. For Israelis, the intifada is when 
people blew up buses and pizza parlors and coffee shops and killed dozens of people, innocents. Um, it, it's a threat of violence. I, I don't think every person who chants on a college campus at Tafada has the vaguest idea of that association or uh, is advocating for that. So I, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Uh, I'm also aware that there are many young progressive Jews who are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. I, I, as I tried to make clear, I think it's the life that young people and old people live in Palestine, and the West Bank, in Palestine, in Gaza, and the West Bank, uh, is very unpleasant and cruel, and they bear terrible costs from both their leadership and the role Israel plays in their lives. We can debate, as we have, whether Israel should play that role, is entitled to play that role. In many ways, it does not matter. They don't like that feeling, and I get it. Um, so I understand that those rallies have lots of emotions going under the surface. For every single participant, they're probably a little bit different. We understand that. What I think is sad and a little bit scary, as I started to say, is that those rallies uh, have three themes that, two themes that I hear over and over again that I don't think are like the Hamas flag. I think they are broadly represented in the crowd and in the themes. One is pre-Palestine or slash pre-Palestine and from the river to the sea. And the second is ceasefire. No one has marched, and this breaks my heart, as far as I know, and I'd love to be wrong about this, many, many, many people, in individuals in Arab countries that have some comfort in speaking, most can't, have condemned October 7th. But there's never been a rally that I know of, of pro-Palestinian people who on October 8th said, not in our name. That was not done in our name. We, we, we advocate for the Palestinian cause. We advocate for anything they want. Free Palestine from the river to the sea, two state solution, one state solution, but not that way. Not what happened on October 7th. I don't think there's been a rally that said that. And the ra no rally for ceasefire or from the river to the sea, the two themes, says free the hostages. In fact, the world has mostly defaced, you know, the world is a small group of people, obviously, defaced the posters of hostages, the kidnapped people, put swastikas on them in some situations, torn them down in others. I, it, I don't understand that. It's hard for for me to understand that. And so what the theme of free the river, free Palestine from the river to the sea, we could debate how many people, it's stupid to debate it, but we, I'm sure there's a range of emotions of the people who say those things, but I wish they'd say something else alongside it. Um, and certainly many of them do believe it should be the an end to the Jewish state and an ethnic cleansing of, of, this, of the country. And I think when Somebody like Bibi Netanyahu says, we're going to keep it from the river to the sea. That, that's for domestic, that's, we call this yeah. uh, attribution bias. Or I, I think they, he's playing to the home crowd. He's, yeah. He knows that people like me are like tired of hearing other people say, we're going to throw you out of there. And he's saying, no, 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 we're going to keep it. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of some of the challenge of Israeli uh, politics and Israeli culture and Israeli life are that we have a swagger about us. We don't care what the world thinks. We do what we think is we need to do to defend ourselves. And at the same time, we really want the world to love us and to embrace us. And sometimes we need that support. So there, there is a, a strange uh, 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 paradoxical cultural uh, aspect to that. But my only point is, and, and we, we can stop here maybe, we've been talking now for, uh, hour and 40 minutes and uh and, I don't know and, how and much brought, more we want to talk about brought, this we brought but, world peace and we brought world peace that's the good news yeah we've done we solved it so yeah um so what I was just gonna close is that uh I wish they'd chant some other things I, I understood that they mean different things by those phrases and not everybody can name the river not everybody can say, claim name the sea and certainly pre-Palestine is a nice sentiment it sounds good it sounds like a, mm -hmm. a liberation thing but some of them do mean it. Some of them do mean that there should not be a Jewish state and that the people who live here should not be allowed to live. So we're, 
we're going to always err on the side of uh, caution, I think. And it would be nice if some of those rallies showed some sympathy for what happened on October 7th. Gas the Jews is not so sympathetic on <laughs> Sydney on October 8th. Yeah. So that's, I think, why we're a little bit paranoid. And sometimes when you're paranoid, it's because people are chasing you. So it's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I'd say, uh, and so, so too with the tearing down of the posters, is like we live in a world where if one person does that, it's going everywhere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to reach almost everyone who it drives crazy. Same thing with Trump. The craziest thing any Trump supporter does is trot it out as typical. Uh, I'd say that, look, I mean, my daughter, I remember uh, when uh, my daughters had been to these demonstrations, they were chaining from the river to the sea. One of my daughters said, you know, some people are starting to chant global intifada. I said, like, don't do that. Like, <laughs> I mean, tell your friends. Like what it means. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and of course they can say, well, it means uprising. And they can point to the first intifada as, you know, mainly kids throwing rocks. I was actually in Israel for two weeks during the first intifada. Uh, and, uh, but, well, of course, what Israelis remember is the second intifada, which is a traumatic memory, naturally. Um, but again, uh, uh, kids chanting global intifada, I mean, they, they mean something that goes beyond Israel, I think. They, 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 it's about imperialism and all, all kinds of things. Um, uh, let's see, is there anything, um, I don't think I got around to saying like, I wish Joe Biden would use the current flow of weapons as leverage to, uh, not, not just because it's, you know, could lead to terrorism against America, but because there's danger of a regional, uh, conflagration. Be nice we, to by the way, here, Israelis feel very strongly that while, there's a great deal of appreciation for American support of Israel militarily. And certainly Joe Biden, in the aftermath of October 7th, gave a full-throated both condemnation of it, as has his spokespeople. It's been uh, rather, uh, there's not a lot of um, uh, whataboutisms uh, or mm -hmm. even-handedness. It's been pretty pro-Israel overwhelmingly. And we didn't talk about this. We're talking about the media. But certainly the the American government, with the exception of some dissatisfaction in the State Department that got reported, it, it, it's unparalleled how much the, the United States government has supported Israel. Having said that, in recent days, the Biden administration has, I think, affected, at least as, I'll just say it this way, Israelis believe that the Biden administration has had an impact to reduce civilian casualties, has changed some of the tactics, and there's a lot of resentment here for it. And my view of that is, if you don't like it, stop. let's stop taking, if we don't like it here in Israel, we should stop taking the money. And which means they don't, and we might lose those aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean, which deter Hezbollah and deter Iran. And it's really complicated. And a lot of Israelis have started to realize that not only do we need American ammunition and munitions generally, bombs and so on, uh, we need American firepower, at least the threat of it. And I, if I were just an American, and if I did not care about Israel, and if I did not see uh, ties between Israel's uh, connect uh, as an ally, uh, I, like you, I would understand that this is, um, we're, we're close to World War III right now. Very, very close. Uh, and, and it's, you know, Russia and Iran versus the United States, uh, you can throw in Syria, Israel, you can throw in China if you want. It's, we're, we're on a precipice, and it's bizarre to me that we are recording this on January, I think, what did I say, 24th? Mm -hmm. And we're about to lock in two very elderly people into the presidency in one of the most risky and threatening times in recent history in America. Forget everything else. Yep. That the American political system is that these are the two candidates of the two major parties is something we might want to think about <laughs> now, <laughs> as Americans. We, we could have a whole new conversation about that. I mean, I, I don't remember a time when I was more uh, uh, less let, felt less encouraged about both the national situation and the world situation. Um, and maybe, maybe we should stop here, Bob, and we could maybe revisit yeah. these topics. Um, I want to invite you. To come back to Israel for two weeks at your at your convenience, maybe when this how, how war big, is over. How big a budget does your university have? Not very big, but but, uh, but I'll tell you. You know, the the first time I went there, 
it was under the auspices of Marty Parrott, the owner of the New Republic. I was about to be acting editor of New Republic for seven months. And Marty felt, of course, he was a pretty ardent Zionist and very well connected in, in Israel. Uh, and when you go there on Ma Marty's dime, I mean, the hotels were nice enough, but the main thing was the connections. I literally had, uh, first of all, Teddy Collick, the mayor of Jerusalem, came by my hotel. We had drinks. I had a one-hour conversation with Bibi Netanyahu on a, on a park bench. Now, he was just a member of the Knesset. He was not prime minister. But uh, my advice to anybody is uh, get, get Marty Paris to make some calls before you go to Israel. Um, it's a small I, country. It is. And it's every. Everybody is at most two degrees of separation from anybody you'd want to talk to here. So I don't know okay. everybody, but I know enough people who know everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, well, let's do it. And in reciprocation, should you ever be in New Jersey, I'll uh, you know I'll drive you down the turnpike, show you you know the 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 whole the whole thing. You'll you'll see the uh, all the all the the high spots of New Jersey. Um, My guest today has been Robert Wright. Bob, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. And thanks for being part of the Non-Zero Podcast.